Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is John Pater, and I will be your service leader this morning. We do hope you feel welcome here. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of the world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we meet on traditional Cree lands now part of Treaty 6 territory. It's a historic gathering place of indigenous peoples, including the Cree, the Blackfoot, Métis, Sioux, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to enhance our vibrant community. So now let's get into some politics. A couple of readings that I'm going to share with you right now come kind of right out of the daily news of our lives, and so much of it, if you're a follower of politics, comes from south of the border, for good or ill, maybe more for ill. But some readings as we uh, reflect on the theme today, reclaiming liberalism. So some excerpts from a CNN story on Trump's mood takes a foul turn. This is by several CNN reporters. And this is from, I want to say, about a week ago. Um, So think back. Although I don't think you have to think back very far. Not much changes, it seems. A political clobbering, bickering aides, and now a public grenade launched across the White House by the First Lady, have placed President Donald Trump in a position he loathes, backed into a corner. A week after standing in the East Room and declaring victory in the midterm elections, the President is isolated and growing more furious by the day. He's openly speculating about replacing more members of his cabinet, though so far has stopped short of executing the dismissals, leaving those aides in a career purgatory. After nearly a month straight of campaigning before adoring crowds, the applause has gone silent and the president has retreated. The tempest has led to rampant speculation inside the building about the fates of other senior staffers, some of whom are beginning to plan their exits. The timing for the president's fury couldn't be worse, considering the White House is heading into uncharted territory with Democrats assuming control of the House. Trump has told some advisors he's itching for the fight, believing it can provide him a political foil. Meanwhile, Mueller is inching closer to issuing his report on the Russia investigation. We're seeing dysfunction that continues to pervade West Wing staffing matters almost two years into the Trump presidency. We're seeing continued factionalism pitting aides against each other, often in convoluted and unpredictable configurations, and we're seeing deep unease within the White House as Democrats prepare to launch an assault of investigation into all manner of administration business. Trump's foul mood, meanwhile, has rendered the White House a tumultuous workplace where outbursts are becoming more common. The decision to scrap a planned visit to an American cemetery in France because of rain over the weekend only deepened the president's conviction that he's being misserved by some of his staffers. Neither they nor the president expected the massive backlash the decision prompted, which sank in over the course of the following hours. As he watched the onslaught of headlines criticizing him for skipping the trip with no backup plan, the president took his anger out on staff. So that's one extract from some CNN stories. This is from David Frum, who, if you remember, he took on Steve Bannon in some monk debates in Toronto. And David Frum now writes, he writes for The Atlantic, kind of his reflections on that debate, called The Real Lesson of My Debate with Steve Bannon. As a debater, Steve Bannon proved engaging and entertaining, writes David Frum. When one of his lines gained lonely applause from a single audience member, Bannon quipped, thanks, mum. That lit up the room. But the longer Bannon spoke, the clearer it became how empty the populist program is. It could observe and exploit the failures of the past 15 years. 
Trump in 2016 promised that he would provide better health insurance to all Americans at lower cost, both to individuals and to the government. That promise has been dishonored. When asked to explain why, Bannon could only point to Paul Ryan and say, his fault. Ditto for Trump's failure to keep his promise to cut taxes for middle-income people by raising them on the financial industry. Ditto for the broken promises to build infrastructure and save lives from opioid addiction. Ditto for the fact that illegal immigration and trade deficits are rising under Trump, despite his emphatic promises to lower both. The populists identified real concerns, but their answers amount to a fraud and a scam. The failures of a basically good system do not justify overthrowing it and replacing it with something evil. So Brian will comment more on that in his sermon coming up. In the first sermon of this series, I showed the historic links between liberalism, rationalism, and Unitarian Universalism. In the second, I painted a pretty bleak picture of the threat Trump-like populism is posing to the tradition of liberal democracy in many parts of the world. So, does the liberal, rational philosophy have a future? Well, the short answer is yes. Liberalism, with its reliance on reasoned discussion, logic, and the art of the compromise, has never, ever completely gone away in the last two and a half centuries. It's been attacked. This is far from the first time that it's been attacked. There are times when this philosophy has been out of favor and even reviled. And let's be fair. There are times when it deserved to be attacked. Reasonable societies have done some terrible things using what once seemed like reasonable arguments. Residential schools, forced sterilization, internment of Japanese civilians in World War II, even the imposition of the War Measures Act in 1970 in Quebec were justified by reasonable men offering rational arguments. Now, they may well and probably were working on false assumptions and bad information. But when they were creating their policy, they were using the tools of logic and rationality. Liberalism is not a perfect philosophy. Any position built on a false premise is likely to cause bad things. And that's the weakness of this philosophy. The number of policies that have been built on the assumption, for example, that some race is somehow lesser in ability or intelligence or whatever than that of the dominant culture has led to centuries of abuse and created social problems that plague us to this day. And while liberalism has much for which to answer, its flaws, however, have not justified the intensity of the attack that the philosophy has endured. In fact, most of the abuses mentioned in the last paragraph have been lessened and improved, if not fixed, by people refining positions in the face of new information and engaging in reasoned and compassionate discussion by beginning to begin to listen, as March Piercy suggests. The real attacks to liberal democratic philosophy have been far more frightening. There have been wars, the rise of fascism, the suppression of the press, the blocking of education, especially for women, the banning of books, the imposition of laws that remove or limit human rights. The intent of these strategies has been to destroy public discussion, to confine real decision-making power into the hands of a very privileged few. And debate has been defamed and shut down. Reasonable critics were labeled dissidents, if not traitors, and they have been silenced and sometimes even killed, like Jamal Khashoggi a few weeks ago. Last week I mentioned the Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels and his theory of the big lie. To remind you, I quote, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such a time as the state can shield people 
from the consequences of the lie. And it thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. Truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. End quote. So the most serious attacks on liberalism have come from advocates of the big lie, populists who inflate whatever legitimate beefs and concerns they might have with fear and disinformation. Liberalism has at times been buried underground by anger, bigotry, and even the violence of war. It seems that when the false logic of oppressors fails and has emptiness put on display, the response is often hateful, loud, and demeaning. The violence of the irrational rages like a wildfire. But still, no wildfire can burn forever. Eventually, the, the, the fury runs out of fuel to burn. The fire weakens and dies and the ground cools. And then things begin to grow again. Seeds that have been buried safely beneath the heat germinate and sprout. And those sprouts often grow stronger, fed by the fertilizer of the spent fires. Liberalism is so much, of the part, so much a part of the roots of Western society that it cannot help but to grow again. It is part of of the genetic structure of our culture. And all we need to do is have patience that the rule of reasoned law, supported by charters of rights, the factual truths of science, and the cooperative nature of human compassion will survive and find their place again. Well, wait a minute. There is more we can do than just wait. And there's more that we cannot do. In the 1930s, George Orwell, best known for 1984, wrote several short, tightly reasoned essays demanding that reasonable and rational people be on guard against the very populism that allowed the growth of fascism and the kind of Trumpism we see today. Remember, this is the 1930s when a lot of people thought Hitler was a pretty good dude for making the trains run on time. We cannot stand idly by, says Orwell, just with patience and a faith in long-term salvation. Smart people can see small fires before they become wildfires. We have to identify and combat those before they get out of control. We must guard our legal systems and our electoral systems of democracy with ferocity. The Trump White House was only made possible by decades of eroding voter rights and the gerrymandering of electoral districts by Republican state houses. That was far more important to creating his victory than any upswelling of populist sentiment. The time to defeat Trump was in 2009 when the Tea Party was being birthed, not 2016. During the Obama years, the ultra-conservatives made large gains at the state level and started making it harder for some people to vote and for Democrats to get elected in a lot of states. Instead of vigilance, a self-congratulatory left went home after Obama's magnificent inauguration, thinking their work was done. It was only just beginning. And similarly, the time to defeat the likes of Doug Ford is right now, just as he's getting started, by loudly protesting his attack on French language rights, by taking him to court over his politicization or his fiddling with the Toronto City Council, his, intact, his attacks on income equality, his gutting of social programming. And the people of Ontario are standing up and going after him right now. And I guarantee you, he's going to hate the courts just as much as Donald Trump does. Orwell demanded that liberals hold themselves to account just as much as the forces with which they disagree. 
It was imperative that liberals police their own thinking and their own language and not simply enjoy the status quo of good lives and the illusion of security. The kind of threat we now face crept up because too few of us, me included, lacked vigilance. Liberalism requires constant challenge from within so that it can be strong and ready to face the challenges from without. And let's be clear. Adopting the tactics of the far right is not the way to keep liberalism strong. We must counter their fear-mongering with reason and even generosity. We must counter lies with truth. We must seek the nonviolent path for as long as we possibly can. Because countering irrationality with irrationality is only going to weaken the liberal cause. Liberal strategies will not change things overnight. It's not that the utterance of a fact of, or a truth spoken with the clarity of a blue gem-like flame immediately undoes all the irrationality and greed that has preceded it. The world doesn't work that way. People don't easily give up their beliefs or their benefits, whether those are real or perceived. Choosing to pursue the liberal path requires... Wait for it. Faith. I know some of you are uncomfortable with that word. Classically, faith is a belief in things unseen. Change requires faith. Belief that something better will happen. And it requires patience. Patience that that better thing will come in its time if we keep working for it. Because few, if any, social ills or injustices or wars are ended overnight. Consider how long women have been struggling for equality in the workplace or demanding safe streets. Consider how long First Nations people had to wait for the closing of the residential schools and then even longer for an acknowledgement that the whole thing had been bad policy and an attempt at cultural genocide. There is a passage in our hymn book, number 698, written by the Canadian minister Wayne Arneson. It's most often used as closing words, but I love them. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear. And the stakes are very high. Take courage. For there is another truth. You are not alone. The challenge then for liberals who trust deeply in the power of reason, the supremacy of fact over unsupported belief, and the value of rational debate, the challenge is just to stick with it. To have faith that the pendulum will again swing away from the big lie, the populists of the populists, and back our way. As Wayne suggests, we have to use institutions like this church to find one another to find people willing to work with us and to wait with us, and most importantly, to help us test and refine our ideas according to a set of principles. Communities like this sustain us while we wait and hope and work. And we have to trust that the most inflated empires and their noisy firebrands will collapse under the weight of their insincerity and lack of a coherent and sustaining ethic. Populism is the fire that burns the land, a fire lit by grievance, sometimes legitimate. It's fueled by anger and fear and even can edge into paranoia. Those emotions, those irrationalities feed the rhetoric, fill the balloon with more hot air. But, and this is the very important but, these things are insufficient to maintain meaningful revolution or change. Too much energy and too much resources have to be expended to keep that fire going, a process that is ultimately futile. Collapse is inevitable, not just for the lack of fuel, but because their movement has no foundation, no real roots that can survive the ravaging fires and renew itself. In that CNN analysis of Trump's crumbling White House, 
We saw that populism is already just starting to crack under the crushing weight of its unfulfilled promises and lies. And Mr. Trump has no recourse, no base on which to build. So he doubles down with the tax on the judiciary and now an empty threat to shut down the Mexican border completely, something that would cribble the economy of both countries in weeks, if not days. As David Frum phrased it in a passage I quoted last week, populist leaders have no plans and no plans to make plans. Mr. Trump has no real plans, no blueprint. He never has had one. He just has his ever-increasing collection of lies and insincere promises. Frum has a damning comment on populism that is a hopeful way to end this series of sermons. He was writing about the people he most hoped to address during the monk debates. He said, I hope to speak finally to those who see populism for what it is and support it. I hope to look in the face of their most self-conscious and articulate champion, Steve Bannon, and tell them, you will lose. You will discover what so many thugs and bullies and plunderers and people who elevate themselves by subordinating and humiliating others have discovered before you. Liberal democracy is tougher than it looks. The cruel, he continues, the cruel always believe the kind are weak. But human decency and goodness can also move human affairs. They will be felt. And today's populists will follow their predecessors into what President George W. Bush aptly called history's graveyard of discarded lies. I have to note that David Frum was George W. Bush's speechwriter. Just saying. So to sum up, yes, the foundations of liberal democracy are under attack. But this is not the first time and it won't be the last. Over the last two and a half centuries, this philosophy coupled with science and education has led us to a healthier, safer world where people are fed better and live longer and where most humans have at least some protections of their basic rights. There is still so very much to do. But liberalism has helped us to get this far and will help us to get much farther still. It will take patience. It will take faith. It will take perseverance. It will take rigid self-evaluation. And it will take the courage to stick to our principles. Amen. The words for meditation are by Doug Hammarskjöld, one of the first directors general of the United Nations. I am being driven forward into an unknown land. The pass grows steeper, the air colder and sharper. A wind from my unknown goal stirs the strings of my expectations. Still, the question, shall I ever get there? There where life resounds, a clear, pure note in the silence.